This year, Malaysia celebrates 50 years of independence. It's a fast-changing society with a new king, one of the youngest in the world. Tuanku Mizan Zainal Abidin is only 45. He's a thoroughly modern man, but a champion of tradition. He must lead a double life, performing his public duties under the spotlight as a king and protecting his private role as a man, a husband and father. At a crossroads in his own life, about to be crowned king, Tuanku Mizan allowed us to be special guests at his coronation. An exclusive opportunity to go behind the scenes of a spectacular ceremony, to see a man becoming a king. palace in Kuala Lumpur. Here, in just a week's time, a new king will be installed. Preparations for this historic event are in full swing. The throne room must be renovated. The precious royal regalia, the symbols of power, must be repaired and polished. Hundreds of staff must be rehearsed and drilled. Coronation will be transmitted live on television. The nation will be watching. But there's an even bigger challenge. Palace staff must satisfy the toughest critic of all, King himself. They must face the fact perfection is the only option. We have to be ready. It's 50 years since Malaysia became independent, and the coronation is expected to be the high point of this anniversary year. The event is keenly awaited in the capital city of Kuala Lumpur. KL, as most people call it, was once a wild west town made wealthy by tin mining. It's become one of the great cities of modern Asia. Its skyline, especially the world-famous Petronas Twin Towers, is a symbol of this young nation's ambitions. Islam is the official faith in Malaysia, and the king is a devout Muslim. But the nation is a melting pot of different peoples and faiths. And it is the only elected rotating monarchy in the world. Peninsula Malaysia is a federation of states. Nine, the majority, are ruled by sultans. The king is chosen from among them, this time from the state of Terengganu. This patchwork of states became a new nation just 50 years ago. On August 31st, 1957, the very first prime minister, Tunku Abdul Rahman, declared a united Malaya independent. Merdeka! 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 The Prime Minister, who was himself of royal blood, believed that Malaya should have its own king. But there was a problem. There were nine powerful and assertive Malay sultans. Which one should be chosen? Tunku's solution was a political masterstroke. He proposed that the sultans take turns becoming the supreme ruler. The king of kings would then be elected amongst the brother rulers, from the brother rulers. So he would then, for a duration of time, for about five years, a fixed time, he would then be the king of kings. This supreme ruler would hold power for a fixed term of just five years. All of the sultans would get a chance to be elected king over time, and the world would have its one and only rotating monarchy. Within two weeks of independence, the new Federation of Malaya had its first king. Daulat Tuanku! And this is unique in the world. It's really a unique system because 
never repeated elsewhere. Almost 50 years later, the rulers of the Malay states still meet in the National Palace every five years to vote for the new king. An order of succession was set in 1957. The longest ruling sultan went first. The role of the council is to make sure the next in line meets with majority approval. It's a secret ballot, and a sultan needs five votes to become king. All deliberations are secret, but the election of Tuanku Mizam never appeared in doubt. First of all, I thank God for my election, and also I feel relieved and thankful to the council of rulers for their trust in me to perform this duty as the Agong. Tuanku Mizan was officially proclaimed king in December 2006, nearly five months before the actual coronation. The king is head of Islam. He can declare a state of emergency, appoint judges, and has the right to pardon. But in reality, the role is largely ceremonial. Fifty years after independence, Malaysia is looking to make its mark on the region and the world. There is intense interest in the new king. It will be a testing five years, as he strives to reconcile the old and the new, progress and tradition. What kind of man can carry such a heavy burden on his shoulders? It's less than a week to the coronation, but Twanku Mizan already has a crammed schedule of royal duties. Today, he visits the Araudia stables near Kuala Lumpur for a meeting to promote Malaysian sports. The king is passionate about many things, but as he settles into his new job, he must balance his own enthusiasms with public duty. It is a task that he was trained for from birth. Twanku Mizan Zainal Abidin was born in 1962. The family has a long and distinguished history. His grandfather served as the fourth king in the 1960s. As he grew up, the prince enjoyed the privileges of royal family life and learnt its complex rituals. In spite of the pressures of royal duty, his parents valued close bonds with their children, a tradition the new king guards with his own family. The young prince was educated at local schools and is remembered by his school friends with affection. Taman alam persekolahan, uh, tuanku ni masih lagi uh, uh, mengingati kawan-kawan sekolahnya uh, sebagai contoh di mana saya pernah uh, terserempak ataupun berjumpa dua, dengan tuanku di masjid uh, dan tuanku sambil bersalam uh, masih lagi bertanya khabar dan kalau di majlis-majlis rasmi uh, tuanku sempat lagi menegur walaupun dengan ekor matanya lah When he was 17 the future king was appointed crown prince and went abroad to finish his studies at Geelong Grammar School in Australia the school has scores of other distinguished alumni, including Prince Charles and Rupert Murdoch. Probably I had a culture shock, maybe, because I've never been out from the state, you know, being in a new place, a new culture. On top of that, being in a boarding school was very tough for me in the beginning, especially the first three months. And uh, I remember I had to give up uh, my economy class because I couldn't understand uh, my teacher's accent. He's uh, too much of an Australian accent. I didn't understand him at all. <laughs> After Geelong, the future king completed his education at Sandhurst Royal Military Academy, and then at university in London, where he studied international relations. By the time he was in his late 20s, the future king had a job as a high-ranking land officer in Terengganu and stood out as a keen and adventurous sportsman. His latest passion was diving. And the exotic islands off the coast of Terengganu offered many challenges. I wish I could, but I stopped to do scuba diving since I became the sultan, because I have, due to the work commitment, 
But before that, I used to go to the islands every month. I make sure that I spend a few days on the island to do scuba diving. The Crown Prince was naturally a most eligible bachelor, but not for long. In 1996, the then Sultan married Her Majesty the Sultana near Zahira at a ceremony at the palace in Kuala Terengganu. The royal couple have four children, two princes and two princesses. As Coronation Day closes in, the palace in Terengganu is a secure refuge for the royal family. The queen plays the lead role in balancing her family's needs against the pressures of royal duty. The royal family makes the most of its moments together. The king has a full schedule. His eldest son schools abroad. And the queen has a busy life as a wife, mother, and public figure in her own right. Photos from a recent family outing to an elephant sanctuary bring back fond memories of togetherness, something the Queen values highly. We always have open communication. We communicate a lot and we do things together a lot as well, you know. And we try to, you know, have dinner. We try our best to have at least dinner together. So like the saying goes like this, you know, a family who eats together, stay together. The Queen plays an important part in public as well as private affairs. For the coronation, she has overseen a makeover of the throne room. The old one was considered rather dark, and the Queen wants a very different look. A team of designers, led by Italian-Malaysian Stella Chua, has been hard at work for more than three months. The Queen, uh, she wants to rejuvenate this place and to uh, lighten up everything. So what we've done here is very much based on an 18th century concept. Lots of white, gold, and you can see all those marbleized art. To complete the Queen's makeover, the designers have imported five magnificent glass chandeliers all the way from Italy. As you can see, the best Murano glass in the world. For this chandelier, they had wanted very subtle gold leaf inside the Murano glass, if you can see, with this turquoise blue accent. Yeah? The preparations of the coronation are a reminder to the people of Terengganu that the king and queen will now have to divide their attention between their home state and the nation. But the king's attachment to local religious life will be unbreakable. Terengganu was the first Malay kingdom to receive Islam and is known as the abode of faith. Mosques are a focal point of everyday life. Supporting them has always been a priority for the sultans. Whenever the king is at home, he attends Friday prayers at the old mosque built by his great-great-grandfather. It is an essential duty. Friday prayers is, is a must that every Muslim has uh, to perform the prayers every Friday. And I, being the head of the religion, in Trinano, I have to perform my duty, and at the same time, it is my opportunity to meet up with my subjects. Anybody has access uh, to, to the Sultan before prayer, after the prayer, because you salam to everyone. It's a very civil relation, a very close bonding relationship 
between the Sultan and his subjects. It's, it's not something that there is a distance and you've, you've got to follow protocol. Of course, if I'm invited to the palace, then I would have to follow protocol. But in a public domain, like in a mosque, then we are all equal. And he is a worshipper just as anybody else. Indeed, everyone seems to know the king. At Kuala Terengganu's bustling central market, it's not difficult to find people who have long and fond memories of his majesty. The king says it was a beautiful game of football that brought him closer to his subjects. Well, maybe it's, it's true what they say. They've seen me uh, playing uh, football. And I've been playing football since from small, as far as I remember. And uh, I've been playing football with the kampong people, with my staff, and uh, with my school friends, my cousins. You know, it's been my passion at the time. Since childhood, Twenku Mizan's enthusiasm for sport has never waned. Today, his passion is for all kinds of equestrian sports, in particular endurance events where riders and their mounts can compete over courses of more than 100 kilometers. Well, I started riding when I was about seven. That was the first time that uh, my father put me on, on the saddle. And, uh, and then he taught me to play polo. We played polo together for a while until he stopped playing polo. And then I stopped playing polo and then there's a gap of like 15 or 20 years before I started uh, riding again. Preparations for the coronation cost the king a place at the Asian Games and the chance of a hero's victory. But back in the saddle, he was preparing for an endurance race in his home state of Terengganu, which he had helped organize himself. For the king, riding has led to enduring friendships too, especially with his horse's devoted vet, Dr. Bala. His Majesty uh, really loved his horses uh, as much as he loved his children. And uh, he really cares for them. And uh, whenever His Majesty is away on a hectic schedule, time to time His Majesty would bring me up and ask how are the horses doing, how are they, how are they training, and the care and well-being. Uh, it's always of great concern for him, always. I can say, his Majesty uh, is always down to earth and always kind to, to the people. All the people of this country uh, uh, respect him and admire him. That respect and admiration is mutual. Twanku Mizan takes a keen interest in the talents of his subjects. On the little island of Pulau Diong works one of the most celebrated of Terengganu's craftsmen. His name is Abdullah Muda, and he makes hand-built boats using age-old skills. He remembers well the king visiting his boatyard. Satu masa itu, saya turun dari rumah. Pada siapa datang ramai, dia kata Sultan Muda nak datang. Dia memang dia lakukan sebab saya Saya baiki satu perahu daripada Belanda masa itu, tahun 1997. Papan keping, tapi saya ada galau sikit lah. Tapi dia 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 naik atas papan itu, papan, papan keping itu dia boleh naik. Kalau kalau sultan-sultan lain, tak, dia ingat tak nak naik atas papan keping itu. 
Yeah. Abdullah yeah. knows the world is changing. <laughs> so he has found new uses for his old skills, making yachts for millionaires and pleasure boats for tourism. I admire him because I feel that he is a living heritage, I would say, because everything, his knowledge about boat buildings are all kept up here in his mind. He's the traditional part. And the other part is that people still come to him and ask him to build modern boats. I think it shows how great, important it is that tradition and modern can live together. Tongu, uh, Tongu Sultan Mizan is embodies uh, the, the, the 21st century. He, 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 he carries the past, right? And he is he, he's, he's ready for a future. Uh, look at his education background. He is from Geelong Grammar. He spent time at Sandhurst. Got himself a, a degree from a, a, from a British university, right? So he has the, the global exposure and he comes back ready to leave. Whenever the Sultan of, of the state of Trunganu attends a function, the, the court music must be there. It is part of the uh, traditional uh, palace protocol. The players are not just any band boys. I mean, they are people part of the court and, and, and they are entrusted with the responsibility of keeping the tradition alive. Apabila main. kita tengok kita main nobak apabila keberkatan tuanku masuk ke dalam balarung seri tau dengan nobak yang kita pukul tu dengan gerak langkah dia tu semakin bertambah daulat tuanku tu it gives me the strength whenever the music is been played and it gives uh, the audience the people who are in present at the time uh, a certain kind of feeling that uh, the Sultan uh, is walking in into the uh, throne room. It does, it does make a difference, I think. Duanku Mizan's philosophy is defined by protecting the past and embracing the future. To Rengenu, the king's home state is changing fast, and the king is happy to encourage innovation. Kuala Terengganu now plays host to the annual Monsoon Cup, the prestigious international sailing event. The king is one of its keenest supporters. But as His Majesty navigates the people of Terengganu into the 21st century, he must now turn his mind to the affairs of the whole of Malaysia. His last act as Sultan was to hand over the affairs of Terengganu to his eight-year-old son, supported by a council of advisors. It is a ceremonial, first of all, to uh, install my son as the regent of the state. It was quite emotional for me. I, I feel very, very sad about leaving Trenganu. But at the same time, I'm also looking forward to perform my duties in Kuala Lumpur. Tuanku Mizan then bade farewell to his state and his subjects and flew to Kuala Lumpur, where he would soon be proclaimed as king. It's a week to the coronation, and in the royal palace, rehearsals are underway climax of the coronation ceremony, when the king and queen sit on these thrones, must be faultless. Palace officials rehearse the crucial moment when they approach the throne, accompanied by the sound of the nobat. Music and action must be in perfect harmony. The Grand Chamberlain will present the king with the royal regalia, including a ritual dagger called a kris. 
king and queen are too busy to attend. Stand-ins will have to do. From the day, timing will be everything. The choreography of this vital moment must be immaculate. The man in charge of rehearsals is the comptroller, Datu Wan Safian. It is Datu Wan's first coronation, and he knows he faces a formidable challenge. Most of us are very eager to face the D-Day, because this is the climax of it. Malaysia's armed forces will be represented by the elite Royal Armoured Corps, a ceremonial battalion. On coronation day, they will be inspected by the king, a former colonel in chief. Every one of the 600 soldiers must play their part to perfection. The army has a huge advantage over palace staff. Soldiers are used to being drilled. At this stage, the comptroller walks with a light step. Outside, the court musicians arrive. Just as well, since according to custom, the traditional instruments of the nomad must be played at the coronation of a king. This is part of the instrument, you know. Soli from Trengganu. Everything is focused on the high point of the drama, the sequence of events when the king is installed. It requires coordination between the palace staff and the nobat and a small brass band who must play the national anthem behind the scenes. It's part being taken today by a tape recording. Today, nothing seems to go quite right. The controller orders another run through. It's just as ragged as before. No one remembers to switch on the recording. But lack of coordination between the different actors and the nobat is giving the comptroller a real headache. At the end of this first day, he is a worried man. But we have to have more rehearsals after this. In other words, I'm not exactly happy. I'm not happy on what we have done. The set isn't ready in the throne room either. Carpenters seize on a gap in rehearsals to complete the raised platform where the sultans will sit on coronation day. As the palace prepares for his coronation, the king has his own very busy schedule. Even games of golf are a royal duty. But it's also one of the ways the king likes to relax. It's almost the last opportunity he'll get before the big day. Today, he must play a golf tournament at the Mines, a luxurious new leisure resort in Kuala Lumpur. The king is a golf enthusiast, but today is not just about pleasure. He is leading a team of palace staff against a rival squad from KL Town Hall. This is a bit of light relief in the king's schedule. But soon he'll have to turn his mind to a more serious royal occasion. second rehearsal, reinforcements arrive in the shape of the Grand Chamberlain. 
Tunku Farrakh Hussein will play a key role at the coronation ceremony and be the eyes and ears of the king as the palace prepares. It's 9.30 and the rehearsal begins with a classic army drill. Everyone hopes that the problems at the first rehearsal can be solved with such precision. Time is definitely not on their side. But still, the crucial action in front of the throne refuses to sync up with the Nova, who play on for much too long. This seems to have a knock-on effect. Still, no one knows when to start the national anthem tape. Yet again, it's a bit of a mess. One problem is that the Nobat's music is sacred and must be treated with care. It's not easy to ask for a change. It's time for a crisis meeting and some tough talk. Assalamualaikum. Warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Okey. <coughs> Saya minta perhatian semua ni yang terlibat ni. <coughs> Saya tak mau kita kata, ah, "Saya tunggu ni, tunggu ni. Tak payah dulu." Nampak tak? Kita dah tahu this step. Okey, next main. Next nobat. Next military. Jadi you kena tahu dah. Nobody must sleep. Tidak ada seorang pun yang dia akan terlalai oh, at any time. That is very very important. Kita mesti alert at all time. Boleh tak? Boleh clear tak? After this, there is no way mesti perfect dah. Mesti perfect. Tak boleh dah. Tak apalah besok ada lagi. Tak apa besok ada lagi. Tak boleh, tak boleh. Saya nak ulang sini. Dengan tadi, kita malu. It's a failure. Untuk kita. Untuk kita lah. Bukan failure apa. Tidak ada koordinasi. No coordination. Betul tak? Kita independen. Kita independen. Tak boleh. Ha, ni kita nak lepas ni perfection. Boleh faham sama tak? Boleh faham tak? Boleh faham tak? Ha? One has got to be to coordinate. He that meeting lasted most shot. of the afternoon. Okay, now it's here. With just three now days to go before the coronation, now the now most important now moment, now the dramatic yeah? climax itself, is still not right. right. You take Rico, tak, masa siapa sebenar? Berapa masa sebenar? Berapa ni? Next comes the full dress rehearsal, and this time the palace staff are aware of a very important visitor. The rehearsal on the 24th, the king and the queen will be coming. So both their majesties will see us from upstairs. As the controller and his team sweat it out of the palace, other vital ceremonial ingredients are being prepared. Kuala Kangsa, some 250 kilometers north of Kuala Lumpur, on the banks of the Perak River, is a royal town, home to the Sultan of Perak. His opulent palace dominates the landscape. Not surprisingly, the people of Kuala Kangsa have a special relationship with the Malaysian royal family. Here for over 30 years, a small company of expert craftsmen has been making royal regalia and then maintaining them in perfect condition. They are always very busy before a coronation. For five weeks, they have been repairing and polishing all the regalia for the king's coronation. Now their work is almost complete. The royal regalia reflect the traditions and heritage of the sultans. Today, the craftsmen are preparing the chokma, or royal maces. They are modelled on old war clubs and are cast entirely of silver. Each kingdom would have its own regalia. That, that comes from, 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 a, from an older tradition. So when you have a king of kings, you, you needed your own regalia, the regalia of the king. So they created a regalia of the king out of the tradition that was already embedded in each of the kingdoms. 
So for example, the Chris that is part of the Yang Dipatuan Agong's regalia, that Chris was made of 11 Chrises from different states of the original Malaya. And, and they brought and forged a new Chris. Regalia leaves Kuala Kangsa in time to reach the Royal Palace in Kuala Lumpur for the dress rehearsal. <coughs> to avoid any possible embarrassment, it heads for the federal capital under police escort. the day of the dress rehearsal, the king arrives for a progress report. He will be watching the run-through from a hidden position. In the throne room, the tension is palpable. closely watched, and not just by the cameras. The rehearsal is over, but what does the most important person of all make of it? National Geographic are summoned to a brief and impromptu royal press conference. A few things need to be rectified. Uh, I think overall it went minor really minor. well. Yes, It's only a minor, minor things. The king pays a visit to the throne room. It appears that he has a number of suggestions to make. I asked them to make some, uh, only minor changes, the curtains behind the, the throne. But I saw, it. I saw, I look at the curtain, it's not properly uh, been drawn. And then there's a camera jutting, the lens, camera lens jutting out from the, from the, <laughs> from the curtain. So I thought it was quite obvious. You know, seeing from upstairs, like I'm seeing, from the audience point of view, you know, on TV. So I, I thought, you know, they should do something about it. Everything is ready at last. Well, almost. In these last hours, more than 400 gifts for the VIP guests must be perfectly wrapped. The final tour of the palace must plump every cushion and perfect every last detail. the night before coronation day. There's less than 15 hours to go before the ceremony begins. But there's one latecomer, one key member of the cast still to be rehearsed. This is the king's nine-year-old son, Tunku Mohammed Ismail, who is the regent of Turingunu while his father serves as king. He attends a school abroad and has flown up just in time to be briefed. Exactly where to sit and what to do. Protocol dictates that adults must address the regent at his own height. And they showed me where I was supposed to sit and what I was supposed to do. I wasn't bothered. They make me feel calm. Okay. For tonight, what he needs is a good night's sleep. So it's time to leave with his older sister for his home and bed. The meeting proves worthwhile. It's revealed a last-minute problem. Yeah. 
Ada footrest ke? Bila dia duduk tu, dia, dia kecil Ada Dia jauh ke belakang ada Jadi kaki dia macam tergantung Ada footrest Footrest Alam, punya kaki Tak ada bantal-bantal lagi belakang tak ada Tak ada Sebab kalau orang lain Dia besar, besar. Ah, Boleh sebab dia small size ha. Jadi bila dia duduk dia, dia punya dia kaki dia tak ni. sampai Sini besar lah Kata eh hmm. Tak apa, takut kejap pun Berapa lama? Tak apa, tapi lama pun tak <laughs> Lama eh? Lama tapi takut nanti bila tangku pemangku berangkat tiba nanti dia ikut tangga ni tadi tu Tak, 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 tak bagi tahu Tak bagi tahu dah kan? Macam tak pesan nama dia Macam tak nama tarik dia Takut dalam depan tu ada Tak, 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 It's coronation day At the Astana Nagar, the National Palace a metal armada of cars begins to pour through the gates. Hundreds of VIP guests are expected to arrive from all over Asia. Parking 200 top of the range limousines is a valet's dream. A ceremonial guard must prepare for the king's arrival. For their officers, improvements can always be made. Precisely on time, the king sets off on a short but historic journey to the National Palace. He is flanked by motorcycle men in black, part of a crack security unit trained to defend the king at all costs. At the palace, his first duty is to inspect the ceremonial guard. Last minute sound and vision checks are being made. The coronation will be transmitted live on Malaysian television. Millions of viewers will be watching. As the appointed hour approaches, the finishing touches are applied. The Grand Chamberlain makes one more last minute check. The Royal Regalia arrived safely from the workshop in Kuala Kamsa. Now they are handed to the warriors who will protect the king as he enters the throne room. Inside the throne room, the VIP guests are gathering. Heads of state, foreign diplomats, prominent business people, and even a superstar. Then, the sultans are announced. One by one, the rulers of the Malay states take up their places. Among them, the young regent of Terengganu, holding his own among some very grand people. For the prince, it's a very special day of school. He will remember his feelings at this moment for a lifetime. I'm proud, happy. And excited. And finally, the last act of the drama begins. As I recall, walking down the aisles towards the throne, I felt a lot of responsibility. It's a heavy burden I have to carry. It's a big responsibility, and I have to do it well. And that's how I felt at that time. And even now, I'm still feeling it. Nobad plays Twanku Mizan to the throne. After that, the Grand Chamberlain recites from memory his ceremonial greeting. It's the turn of the Grand Chamberlain to present the king with a ceremonial dagger, the Chris Panjang di Raja, the most important piece of regalia, which symbolizes the power and authority of the king. Normally, this is practice for the Agong to pull out the Chris and kiss the Chris. What I did was I just bring the Chris up to my forehead it's my way of uh, accepting the Chris. The Chris itself symbolizes the power of the king on his subjects and as, as the protector of the, uh, the land. Finally, 
Tuanku Mizan pledges an oath to the nation. Beta akan menjalankan seadil-adilnya pemerintahan bagi Malaysia mengikut undang-undang dan perlembagaan negara serta memelihara dengan sempurna setiap masa agama Islam dan berdiri teguh di atas pemerintahan yang adil dan aman dalam negara. Daulat Tuanku Daulat Tuanku Daulat Tuanku Daulat Tuanku Daulat Tuanku Daulat Tuanku Praises to them. I think they have done really well. I'm very proud of them. I have full confidence in himself, in Tuanku, to carry out his duty as Yang Dibu Tuan Agong, the King of Malaysia. Shawa. Daulat Tuanku. Daulat Tuanku.